All right, good morning, Rock Church. How's everyone doing? Uh, if we can just get everyone to stand up, we're going to get uh, started with praise and worship. Here we go.
Thank you for listening to the message today. We would love for you to share in the comments how God is speaking to you through His Word. If you would like to join our online church community, be sure to subscribe and click the bell icon on our YouTube page so you're notified when we post a new weekly sermon. You can also learn more about The Rock Church by visiting our website, rockag.com. If you are in the Scottsdale, Phoenix area, make sure to come visit us for Sunday morning service at 10 a.m. We would love to meet you in person. And if you would like to support this ministry today, you can donate by visiting our website and clicking the giving tab at the top of the page or by texting the amount you would like to give to the number 84321. Then follow the instructions in the text reply. Thanks again for joining us. We look forward to hearing from you. It's good to be in the house of the Lord, isn't it? Amen. Man, I never get tired of going to church. And I love everything about it. I love getting a few minutes to talk with as many of you as I can. I really love singing to the Lord. And thanks for leading the way, Bethany, today. Uh, and our worship team. Uh, I, just, I just love church since the day Jesus got a hold of me. I love being with God's people in the presence of the Lord. The Lord is good. We're going to honor our graduates here this morning. We have some graduates. They couldn't all be here, but many of them are here. And we just want to give honor where honors do. Next Sunday, this uh, week from today, will be Pentecost Sunday. And we're going to start a series on the Holy Spirit. We're going to pray for you. If, if you're sick or whatever area of your life you may need prayer, we're going to pray for you. And then the week after that, we're going to honor. It's Memorial Day weekend, and that's always a special weekend here to honor those that fought for us and didn't make it back. And it's always a time to honor those that did. And then June's here. But uh, today is a special day. I'm going to call your name. And Pastor Jill is going to come and hand out. We have gifts. We have fire Bibles for our graduates. And uh, so when I call your name, if you'll come, Bethany James. And you can just face me. Yeah, get your gift and face me. You can't run away. No, no, you're going to stay right there. <laughs> and because we want to pray for you. But she got a Bachelor of Science in Physics from ASU. And I might add, she's also in the Arizona School of Ministry studying for the ministry. So, I mean, it's amazing. Praise the Lord. And then we have Ashley Skolrud, wherever she is. Ashley, come on up. She has earned her master's degree in uh, fine arts in creative writing from Lindenwood University. And that was a lot of hard work, wasn't it? So let's, let's give her a hand. We have Torin McLaughlin. I think Torin is here. High school graduate. He made it. Go Torin! Santan Charter School. We're so proud of you. And then we have Juliet Ado. If she will come, Juliet. She has earned her Master of Science in Biomedical Engineering. And... Uh, and I have, we're going to celebrate today, but I have some sad news. She's, not that she's headed to the University of Texas, that's not sad news, but she's headed next to the, uh, Texas to earn her PhD. So we're excited for her. I know all these young people, they're brainiacs. They're a lot smarter than I am, and I'm thankful for it. But would you extend a hand their way, and we're going to pray a, a prayer of blessing uh, one graduation leads to another graduation, which leads to another graduation. And we're just going to pray a prayer of blessing and open door and favor for these young people. Lord, I'm just so thankful for these graduates that stand before us today. They are special. They are unique. They do love you, Lord, every one of them. And Lord, I, I would just like to bless them in this way today. 
that you would continue to open doors for them in their future that no man can close. And Lord, close the ones that need to be closed. We celebrate a graduation today and we know in life there's many, many more opportunities and transitions that will lead to good things in their life. And as their church, as their pastor, as their church family today, we bless them in this moment and celebrate alongside them. Lord, I'm so excited for them. We celebrate with them today. And Lord Jesus, we give you all the glory, honor, and praise. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Let's give them a hand as they're seated this morning. Oh, hold it. The picture queen has come back. Praise the Lord. She does this to me at home too, y'all. So let's give her another hand. Praise the Lord. Well, we're going to talk, have a graduation message, but I think there's something in here for all of us. Uh, I mean, we just uh, honored a group of people that's got 16, some of them got 18 years of school, and some's got three or four more years of school. And, uh, but life is a continuous graduation service. We, we get through school and college and graduate work and all these things, but life is going to include, as you well know, many other encounters that we need to grow through and graduate through and all those things. And then on a side note, I think that's one reason we need to celebrate the wins along the way. You know, because you get a few victories under your belt, it's easier to get another victory down line, right? I just, I don't know, just reflecting a little bit. And I mean, we grew up, we went to grade school and I'm, we graduated grade school. And then we graduated junior high and we graduated the teenage years. You know, many of you know, I thought I'd lost my daughter in junior high, but she came back around and she's an awesome young woman of the Lord. But there's many, many graduations in life, high school, college. And then after that, you got to travel the road of adulthood. And then I, I don't know, I call it the school of hard knocks is when you get all these things under your belt and you've got to go out and learn how to work and pay the bills. And man, I'm in that phase. I'm really enjoying that. So I got three paying the bills and one to go and he's learning how to pay the bills. Can I get an amen if you've been there? Uh, I might be able to retire someday. There's many, many transitions in life. I mean, even from one age to the other, 50s, 60s, 70s, and then, of course, the ultimate graduation someday when we can spend eternity with the Lord. Have you ever gotten nervous? Anybody here ever been nervous? Have you ever been afraid? I have. I mean, you know, when, uh, I still get nervous all the time. I'm not this morning, but sometimes I get nervous before I come up here and preach. And I've been preaching thousands of messages and I can still get Nervous. I will say, you know, when we come back from the COVID thing, we were shut down eight weeks and I come back and everybody was wearing masks. I thought I'd come and there was a whole church full of outlaws. I got a little fearful. I think we all get fearful and nervous sometimes, especially, especially, and there's a dozen ways it could happen. But if you're asked to speak, I mean, I, that's what I do is I speak. But some people would rather die and go be with Jesus than speak. <laughs> I mean, in big settings, small settings, I mean, the knees get weak. There's difficulty in swallowing. You might even get teared up. I mean, there's all kinds of physiological reactions to fear and nerves and all those things. And I'm, I'm having a little fun. Uh, and, and some of our graduates haven't, 
had their first public speech yet, what they didn't know is they're getting ready to. I'm just teasing. We had a moment yesterday, a history-making moment in our family, and I want, that I think all of us were afraid to speak a little bit. We had a touching moment as we celebrated my brother. He's, I want, he's my brother-in-law, but he's really my brother. We cel- uh, celebrated his birthday for 70 years. He really is my bro. But one of the greatest hazards sometimes in life is fear. Fear can immobilize you. Fear can paralyze you. Fear can keep you from doing things that you know, sometimes you know that you can do or other times you haven't done it yet. But fear can have a very negative effect on us as we make life's journey. And I'm going to uh, share three guidelines this morning that may help you in a number of areas, and we'll start with it. Fear. Paul writing to Timothy in 2 Timothy 1 and 7 said this, in just one verse this morning, Paul said to the young preacher, for the Spirit of God, for the Spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. Another translation, God does not give us a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. Now, this is a powerful verse if you understand the context of what's going on here. Timothy was probably the age of some of these graduates this morning. He was a young guy. He was just getting started. They were pioneering this new faith around the world, and Paul is mentoring him. In fact, uh, Timothy was pastoring... uh, probably many small congregations in Ephesus. And Ephesus was a, about like our culture today. It was pretty crazy uh, kind of culture. And so Paul writing to Timothy is encouraging. And he's saying, God didn't give you a spirit of fear, but of love and of power and of sound mind. Aren't you glad the Spirit of God, aren't you glad that Jesus Christ, when you're facing transitions in life, decisions in life, uh, maybe a step that's going to take you to the next phase of your life, that God will give you His Spirit and that you don't have to fear? And sometimes, you know, courage, and I'm not going to really speak on courage today, is just saddling up and riding into battle anyway. As we grow as people, we need to face our fears. I want you to look at your neighbor this morning and say, you need to face your fears. Oh, I saw some of you roll your eyes at each other. Look back. I think the ladies had way too much fun with that one, guys. You better listen to them. See, when you have Christ in your heart, you can always know that He's in control. When it's chaotic, and it is chaotic in our world, in our economy, in our governance, in the medical way, but in our homes, in our households, in our family structures, in our work structures, in our school structures, whatever happens, we can always know that Jesus is in control of our lives. Now, I know that's simple. That's Sunday school. But when you get that deep down in your heart, it'll give you an anchor, especially in the transitions of life. How many of you know transitions aren't easy? You know, I thought when I got my bachelor's in college, and and I know that Bethany probably thought that, and some of you that earned your master's, I thought if I never had to write another paper, ever never had to take another midterm or final test, life would be a piece of cake. How wrong I was. But when you know that the Lord is in control, it does something for you spiritually, mentally, and emotionally, and it helps you face your fears. Max Lucado said this, Fear doesn't want you to make the journey to the mountain. If He can rattle you enough, Fear will persuade you to take your eyes off the peaks 
and settle for a dull existence in the flatlands. I couldn't shake that. I looked back over my life and I thought maybe at times, and I've always got my eye on the peak, but I may have settled sometimes for the dull life of the flatlands because it was a little easier. Or maybe I didn't have to face my fears. Don't settle for anything less than the Lord has for you. You want me to say that again? Don't settle for anything less than God's plan for your life. His plan is exceedingly, abundantly, and above and beyond all you could ever ask or imagine. Your plan for you may be a good plan. His plan for you is even greater than your plan. The Lord said in Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the plans I have for you. Plans to give you a hope and future. And by the way, it's not over. You say, well, I'm this age, I'm that age, I'm this age. It's never old or over. God's not done. The Lord is faithful. He's in control. I believe in my heart. There's some things that the Lord's put in your heart or He's put in your mind and maybe you've stepped back and maybe you've given up and, and you've settled to live in the dull places of the lowlands and God has another peak. God has another victory. God has another graduation. God has another transition where you can celebrate again. Let, give the Lord a hand for that this morning. Yeah. Don't settle for less. But in order to do that, you, you have to face your fears. You have to live courageously. You have to get through difficult jobs. You have to get through difficult ages uh, uh, as you transition by age. You have to be people of honesty and integrity. That's a hard thing in our culture. We're tempted to compromise and compromise our integrity and honesty. There's all kinds of mountains that you need to climb as we walk this walk of life. Face your fear. There was a test conducted, uh, and I don't know which university it was, uh, and they set it up and they went actually through hundreds of young people. They were uh, high school and college kids and, and here's how they set it up. The professor was going to write three lines out, a long line, a medium line, and a shorter line, bring 10 kids into the room at a time, and have the room raise their hand when he pointed to the longest line. Only nine out of 10, there was one out of every 10 that really didn't know what the other nine knew. The nine were going to raise their hand when he pointed to the second longest line. First group comes in. He points to the second longest line. And everybody but one raised their hand. 75% of the time, the one that was right put their hand down when they saw everybody else's hands were up. I thought that was interesting. The researchers concluded that many would rather stand with the majority and be wrong than risk being right and being alone. Graduates, stand for what is right. If it's right, it's right. Right? And if our culture ever needed people that would just stand for what is right, not arrogantly, not ugly, not rebelliously, but just stand for what is right, our culture would be a much better place. And if there's ever been a time we need to stand up and speak and walk in what is right, it's now. Never. Everybody say never. 
Never take your cues from the crowd. Amen. And let, let me just say this. Don't be a rebel just to be a rebel. But if you're right and you know you're right, stand up for right. Have to face your fear to do that. Quite often, actually. Number two, you need to forget your failures. Has anybody ever failed? We're in good company. Man, I've made so many mistakes. Wow. Sometimes I'm amazed at how many times I've made mistakes. Philippians 3 and 12 says this, and we'll read a few verses here this morning. And as we get ready to read the verses, now when Paul wrote this to the Philippian church, Paul was in prison, chained to a Roman guard. So if you haven't read the book of Philippians in a while, read it in the context in which it was written, and what an encouraging book it is. But here he is under guard in extremely poor conditions, at least most likely it was. I would say any jail is pretty poor conditions, wouldn't you? And he's writing to the church in Philippi who's under the gun as well. They're being persecuted for standing up for what is right. And Paul, talking about his personal relationship with Christ, says this, not that I have already attained this, or have already arrived at my goal. The Apostle Paul said that. But I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do. That now, when, when especially Paul says, but one thing I do, I mean, my eyes go laser. One thing, I mean, it's not a few things. There's not a couple of principles here. To, to get to the goal, to get to the prize, to get to the finish line, to make it through grant, to make it through transition. Paul said, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, I strain toward what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Paul said, look, I haven't, I haven't arrived. I'm not perfectly like Jesus yet. I'm, being com I'm not complete. I'm being completed. But he said, I strive. I press on. When I get knocked down, I get back up. When I make a mistake, I get back up. He said, I haven't even, I'm not, haven't even attained that level of maturity yet. Can I tell you something? At every age, we're still growing and maturing. Amen. We're still learning. We're still growing. We're still maturing. And you know what? If you don't have that mindset, guess what happens when you get my age? You quit growing up. <laughs> now, I know I act like I haven't grown up sometimes. Because I like to have fun. That's what Paul is telling us. I haven't attained yet. But one thing I do. And let me tell you something. Paul made a bunch of mistakes. I mean before Jesus got a hold of him. He was a terrorist. Yes. He was traveling the known world. Persecuting Christians. Carrying them off to jail. And even part of their execution. Till Jesus got a hold of him. I mean, Paul had made many mistakes. He said, but I, you know, what if Paul couldn't forget what he had left behind? He did things, not some of us, most of us, maybe not any of us, would ever even think about doing. Now, you know, when Justin first met Kylie, I thought about locking him up for a little while. <laughs> Actually, I got the best son-in-law on the planet. And I mean that from all my depths of my heart. He's number one in my book. There's no way I'm giving my daughter to somebody if I didn't love you like I do. I had to give her away. 
Now he's number one and I'm number two. Okay. That's true. right. True. Easy on that, sister. I'm not as happy about it as you are. <laughs> I'm still in... I'm, they've only been married six months. I'm still in transition here. <laughs> I haven't fully graduated. Come here, kindly. <laughs> I better put him back on his heels. I, I, I'm still, oh. Where were we? I totally lost my focus. He said, one thing I do. I'm not looking behind at all the mistakes I made. I don't have time to really to massage it because we got to keep moving. But a lot of my time counseling is spending time with people helping let, let go or heal from some of their past failures. The power of the past is extremely powerful. It can shape us mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. But the power of our future in Christ is much more powerful than the power of our past. And that's why Paul said, I'm going to press on. I'm not, you know what? I'm not going to look back. And as you walk into your future, the power of your past begins to let go of you and it begins to heal you. But, and, and there's certain spots along the road you just got to stop and heal. But then you got to, with Christ, have to get your head up and you say, you know, God's not done with my life yet. God's not through with me yet. It's hard. It's hurtful. I'm still trying to rebound from this thing back here. But Paul said, one thing I do, I've got to forget. And we don't forget very easy. And it's hard to forget. And we get scared. Scarred, but their scars prove that the wounds have been healed and we just press on as we press on in the grace of Jesus Christ. That thing that hurt us, that thing that wounded us, that thing that controls us, that thing that beats us up, all of a sudden you graduate and you don't, you're not even that person anymore. That's what the grace of God will do for you. But we have to push, push. It's hard. And we've all been there and we'll all be there again to some degree. Paul makes two implications here when he makes that statement. He's saying this, I refuse to allow failures to become destructive in my future. He said, I refuse. He must have struggled with guilt somewhere along the line with the tragedies and the horrific things he did. He said, no, I refuse to allow failure to destroy me now. And he refuses to allow failure to beset his future goals for his life. i tell you what. That's not rocket science, but if you'll write those two things down and live by it, your life will be different. Amen. The secret, he said, was to put his past behind him and face his fit future with a positive mental attitude. Now, the grace of God will help us with all that, right? Because I can... If I, when I've really messed up, it's hard to overcome a little bit, isn't it? I mean, come on, let's just be real. Somebody said it, and I didn't come up with it, but attitude, ad, <laughs> Alex, when you uh, do the video, delete that. And you all didn't hear that. Attitude, everybody say attitude, attitude. determines altitude. I'd still like to massage that first thought because that might describe how some of us think sometimes. <laughs> you know what? Now, don't y'all leave here and say I said that, okay? Not from the 
not from the platform. Y'all are going to forget everything I said today. The first thing you're going to do when you get home is take, you'll never believe what my pastor said in church. <laughs> I've said worse. There's going to be failures. We're going to fail again. I know that's not the good news. I know that's not uplifting, but it's uplifting if you realize that it's got coming and there's solutions when it does happen. Paul had put his past behind him. He was moving forward. It's not a matter of if I fail, it's when I fail. It's coming. I would like to think it's not coming, but it is coming. None of us are perfect. Not one. There's no one, there's not anybody that never does anything wrong unless they don't do anything. We cannot allow failure to define who we are. I've made plenty of mistakes, but I'm not going to let them define who I am. In World War II, Winston Churchill, and some of y'all have heard this story. It's been told in many, many uh, places. Uh, had the commencement address at Oxford University which was a big deal. So it wasn't just that there were graduates graduating from Oxford, but there were scholars that came from all over the country to hear him speak. And most everybody here has probably seen pictures. You may have even seen the movie. Not, I guess it's been a little longer than I think ago, a couple years ago now. But, you know, he walked into the commencement service. He walked out on the stage. He always, most all the time, had a top hat, a cane, and a what? A cigar. So he walks in with his top hat cane cigar. He walks in front of a podium or a platform. He sits his hat on the podium. He sits his cane here. And he takes his cigar out. And the people stand and they give him this great <coughs> applause. He asks him to be seated. He's ready to speak. And he looks at the audience and he said three words. And some of you know it. Never give up. The people applauded. They waited. He gazed into the audience. And then with more volume... He said, never give up. He took his hat, he put his cigar in his mouth, and he took his cane and he walked off. Never give up. It's a really big deal. Never give up. Fight on. Press on. Get through. Get your high school diploma. Get your bachelor of arts or bachelor of science. Get your master's. Get your doctorates. Get your PhD. Go to medical school. Go to law school. Whatever it is. But there's many more other graduations after that. And they're difficult and they're hard a lot of times. Some are easier than others. But never give up. Keep your eye on the mountain peaks of your life. And don't settle in your life for the dull lowlands. Because Jesus has better for you. Don't settle for less than the plan of God for your life. Never give up. I told all my kids, never give up. Never give up. Never give up. I've lived my life. 
Never give up. Never give up. Don't give up. You, you've got Jesus walking beside you. You can lean into him. Jesus said when he left the earth, he was going to the Father and he had sent the Holy Spirit who he called a comforter and a counselor and an empowerer. Don't give up. Jesus is by your side. Don't give up the presence of God. Jesus is for you, not against you. Let me say that again. Jesus is for you, not against you. Walk in relationship with God. And by the way, Jesus forgives me when I fail. Jesus forgives me when I'm down. Jesus forgives me when I sin. Jesus forgives me when I mess it up. Jesus always forgives. That's who he is. Well, I went to preaching a little bit, but that's all right. And lastly, Follow your faith. That's what we've been talking about really all day. Now, the book of Hebrews, and we're going to read uh, a few verses, the first three verses of chapter 12. Uh, and this group of Christians are, have really been struggling. They're losing uh, houses. They're losing properties. Their families are being split up. All for their faith. It was just for their faith. And so they're experiencing hard times. And the writer, and we're not sure uh, who the Hebrew writer was, but it sure is powerful. And we're going to read from Hebrews 12, 1 through 3. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, that's those that's gone before us, let us throw off everything that hinders. And let me just interject that something as I'm reading, <clears throat> sometimes, and especially in seasons of graduation, you got to clean up the clutter a little bit <clears throat> so that you can get focused. And sometimes that takes a little bit of time. <clears throat> Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And watch this. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Fixing our eyes, say it with me, on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Why is he the pioneer? Because he went to the cross for us. He plowed every ground. He understands every feeling. He knows every situation. The Hebrew writer explains all that in the book. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, Consider Him. Everybody say, consider Him. That's Jesus. Who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. And we understand, and Easter's uh, just a few weeks behind us, that He was bruised for our transgressions. He was beaten with a whip. He was made to carry His cross to to the crucifixion site. Couldn't get the... Y'all know that nailed to a cross to pay a price so that we can live in forgiveness and so that our sins can be forgiven. And rose the third day. Rose the third day. He kept His eyes on the prize as He paid the price for us. Do we have any runners in here? Well, some of y'all made it. I'm not going to make you run. Just I just want to. <laughs> I'm not a runner. I hate it. Even when I played basketball and all the other sports, I hated training. I still hate training. I just want to play. <laughs> if you run a race, your eye is ultimately where? The finish line. It's the finish line. Houston was a runner. He was a very good runner. Uh, he, he did have such a heart if one of his teammates got injured on the course he was a cross country runner Houston would quit running and go help his buddy <laughs> and uh, I, I have to go looking for him like the sun <laughs> let him lie <laughs> run <laughs> but Houston's got such a good heart he wanted to take care of his bro <laughs> he, he knew eventually he's going to finish the race and cross the Finish line, but a runner has to keep his eye. He has to have a reference point. 
which is the finish line. If you're lost and Elvis is here uh, today, my White River friend, my Apache friend from the White Mountains, and I've known him 25 years, and this is really true. Now, he's 100% Apache. I'm 100%, no, actually, I'm kind of Heinz 57. But <laughs> inside of me, there's a little Apache man. And Elvis knows that. Well, at least I've been trying to convince him for 30 years. <laughs> my native brother, and it's good to see you again, my friend. He's got me lost in the woods in the White Mountains more than anybody I know. He has karma. He hasn't even told you all the times he got us lost. And he just laughs because he knows sooner or later he can find his way out. I got stories. I don't have time to tell them. But I remember losing True North on the GPS. And I said, which way we go, Alvis? He said, that way. Well, the thing is, the truck was in the middle of the woods that way about a mile away. And if we're off a foot, we're going to be trapped in the middle of the woods at night when it drops below freezing. You did that to me. Finally, the Anglo guy come up with an idea. To, we had, there was four of us to spread out within sight and, and talk to each other and yell at each other through the woods because Elvis said it was that way somewhere. We thought if we spread out over about 100 yards that maybe one of us would hit it and we wouldn't freeze to death in the night. I actually had voted to walk back down in the canyon and build a shelter, but not the guys I was with. We're about 200 yards in the walk and the GPS kicks on and finds true north. Hallelujah, we made it home again. Amen. True north, reference points, finish lines. You remember Apollo 13, right? I mean, wow, there's so many stories there and they made a movie of it back in the 90s. Uh, but I mean, they needed 39 seconds to correct their course. That's what it ended up taking. But they couldn't afford to use uh, the computer power to do it because they were running out of power. And Jim Lovell, who was the, the, the main pilot, had to steer this little, I call them tuna cans, if you've ever gone to Cape Canaveral and looked at them, you cannot believe what these guys went up in or what they came back in. They had a little window and he said, if I can keep my eye on that dot, I can make the adjustments manually. He had a reference point. That reference point ended up being the earth and for 39 seconds with his eye on the ball, he made the right corrections and if he hadn't, they would have died. And that was one of many things they did where they could have died. Church, more than ever, we can't lose sight of the reference point, Jesus Christ. Jesus is true north. When things go crazy, Jesus is still tried and true. The same yesterday, today and forever, the scripture says. We need to keep our eyes on true north, Jesus Christ. When culture's changing, ideas are changing. My Lord, even history's changing. Can you believe that? I'm not going to get political. Well, I might, but I'm not. Jesus is true north. Focus on Him. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith. He's the great navigator. Yeah, He's the Savior of the world. The Scripture says, He who the Son sets free is free indeed. He's the Savior that will give you eternal life. But I'll tell you what, He's the great navigator navigator of all navigators that can take you through every transition, every tough time, every graduation. He can empower you to do things you can never do on your own. Jesus is good, isn't he? He's better than good. What is it? God's perfect son, GPS. I'm going to write that in my notes. 
And it's true, Kim. The thing is, it's true. Has the Lord ever steered any of you wrong? One time? I mean anybody. One time? Never. And you know what? And I'm almost done. Notice I said almost. <laughs> what does that mean when a preacher says that? Nothing. Thank you. <laughs> My people know me well. Your roast may burn yet. Someday the ultimate graduation will come. When we step from this earth into eternity. And it's not going to be hard, y'all. Because it's so much better than the chaos down here. And life is good. Y'all know I love life. I enjoy life. I embrace life. The Scripture's right when it said, but we're just, we're just traveling through. Paul writing to the Philippians a little later said, but our citizenship is in heaven. He's encouraging them for the here and now. But he said, but, but, but the real finish line is when it's all done down here. The real graduation is when you, one step in one second. I don't know. It'll be different for all of us. But in one second, in one step, when we take our last breath down here, we'll step into something that's so unbelievable. The Scripture says that life is a mist that appears for a little while and vanishes. And now I'm old enough to know that's the truth. Where did the time go? <laughs> right? My senior citizens, we're all nodding. <laughs> Where did the time go? The most powerful phone call I ever received in my life was from my mother. Many of you have heard the story and I won't tell the whole story. In this profession, you're around a lot of folks suffering at the end, as I have been. Uh, so in 35 years or whatever it's been, you see a lot and you're there at the end a lot for others. My mother suffered long. And, you know, I don't know how to answer all those questions, why she did, why she didn't. I will tell you one thing about my mother. She never lost her joy. Because she had her eyes on the prize. And she was in and out of the hospital, Darla, more than we can count extended stays and suffered and I, I won't massage that any more but I've come out of a meeting with Pastor Lawrence actually we we met at Chick-fil-A it's a good place to have a meeting it's better than the office and I we had just left I walked out the door before I could get to my car the phone rang and I looked and it's mom. I answered the phone. Mom, how you doing? She's happy. She's, we talk about 15, 20 seconds. She said, and I, I can't even talk as Southern as she could talk if I had to. My sister-in-law can almost talk that Southern, but uh, Southern Bales. She said, now honey, I've got some good news. She'd been in the hospital about three weeks in. I said, well, mom, I like new good news. She said, the doctor has just come in. And her doctor was a female and said, she has told me I don't have over two weeks left to live. She said, right on the phone. She said, now don't you cry. 
She said, in fact, the surgeon's here, the doctor's here, two nurses are here, and my pastor's here. And she said, we've just had a praise and worship service. She said, I'm going to go be with Jesus in two weeks or less, honey. She said, now you listen to me. Here's how I want you to do my funeral. Bam, 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 bam. Yes, ma'am. My mother sprinted to the finish line. She suffered. Yes, she did. She walked with God all her life through many transitions, peaks and valleys. But she never settled for the dull lowlands of life and kept her eye on the finish line to the very end. And when she, because she had Jesus in her heart, when she could see the line and she knew it was time, and she knew it wasn't going to be long. She didn't get down. She didn't go negative. She was unhealthy. She sang Amazing Grace and lifted her head up, and my mother sprinted to the finish line because she knew what laid across that finish line would be better than anything this earth has to offer because Jesus Christ is better and what he has to offer is better than anything this earth has to offer. Yeah. Hallelujah. And she graduated with victory. Now, I want to go to heaven. Do you? Yes. Not today. <laughs> but as the old hymn says, it'll be worth it all when we graduate that final graduation and we see Jesus. And you know what? We're going to get to see that great cloud of witnesses. You, you can't, you can, you can't, don't pray to them. They can't answer prayers for you. But they are. Those that have Christ are up there waiting on us. And it's not going to be hard. Lord, It's hard for me to even pray this because I want to say we thank you for life's transitions as difficult as they are. The plan you have for us is always better when we graduate. <laughs> These graduates today, which we are all so proud of, it's better for them because of what they've accomplished, what they've learned, how it equips them for the journey here. And again today as I pray, we, we bless them and encourage them in their journey. I would pray this, Lord, in this crazy world we live in, and we're so blessed, Lord. We're just, with all that's even gone on this past year, so many in here would say, yeah, but we're just, I'm just still so blessed beyond measure. I pray, God, that we could fix our eyes on your son, Jesus. And I pray, Lord, that we could press on with endurance. Will you stand with me?
Lord, you said in the word in your Bible that your grace is sufficient, that your power is made perfect in our weakness. And it's true. And today together and collectively, Lord, as we get ready to leave this building, we thank You for Your grace. We thank You for Your grace. What You did at the cross. For anybody who will, Lord, we didn't have to find the path to you. You came to us. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Oh, Father God, you sent your son to us. We didn't have to find our way to heaven, and we couldn't anyway. But you came to us, and we're grateful. With every head bowed, just before we leave, I want to pray for you. Is there anybody here this morning that says, I want to give my heart to Jesus? Young or older in between said, I want to make Jesus Christ Lord and Savior of my life. Would you slide your hand up and I'll just pray for you wherever you are. It may be for some that you just I see that hand. You need to make a recommitment to, to God through His Son, Jesus. And you may be at home too. You're watching online. If that's you, just stand up in your living room or wherever you are. Say, I'm going to, I've got to, I'm going to get my eye on the target, Jesus. With every head bowed, when it all comes down to the end, and again, I've been with people hundreds of times, there's only two things that matter because I'm there. I, be I believe it. It's my is my relationship with God right and is my relationship with people right, especially my family and friends. It always comes down to that at the end. Always. So if it always comes down to that, at the end, it's always what mattered anyway, isn't it? <laughs> is my relationship with the God right? Is my relationship with others right? Anybody else that you'd like me to pray for you today? We've got several that raised their hands. So Elvis has a family member that may not make it. They're coming together at the hospital. What we'll do, Elvis, let me pray for those that raise their hand to give their heart to Christ, and then I'll meet you with some at, here at the stage, and we'll pray together. Okay, bud? Would you all follow me in this prayer to help those that slid their hand up? Dear Lord Jesus, I'm so thankful today to have experienced your presence. My heart is touched. I'm here because I need you. I need a Savior. And I'm asking you today to wash me and cleanse me, forgive me of my shortcomings and sins, and all my failures. And I'm asking you, Jesus, to come into my heart, to come into my life, to be Lord, to be Savior. 
I make that invitation to you right now. The door of my heart and my mind is open. Come in. Thank you, Lord. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. It seems like it shouldn't be that easy, but it is if you meant it from your heart. That's how, just one step. So congratulations to all that that slid your hand up both here and at home. Let's give them a hand. Let me say a prayer over you and I'll let you go eat now. How about that? Love all of you. Appreciate you. It's a joy to be your uh, pastor. And Elvis, I will meet you up front. We'll pray. We'll pray together, my friend. Uh, Lord, I thank you for the men and women in the house. There's children in children's churches and babies in nurseries. And it has been good to be in your house, in your presence with God's people together. Lord, after this last year, we valued being together more than we ever have. So Lord, as we go, bless us. As we go, keep your hand upon us. As we go, guide our steps. As you go, keep us covered and protect it. As we go, Lord, be with us always. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen.